Working It Out, a podcast show about diversity, equity, and inclusion in our workplaces, our communities, and our lives. A show where we put diversity and inclusion to work. Got problems on the job. We're working it out. With that work place got you stressing. We're working it out. With that yeah, we're me. working it out, working it out, working it out. Welcome. I'm Dr. Vanessa Weaver, your host of Working It Out. On this episode of Working It Out, I'm joined by the renowned Reverend Leah Daughtry who is a nationally renowned and recognized organizer, political activist, a political strategist, and we're gonna talk a lot more about that, author and a faith leader. Reverend Daughtry is the daughter of a long line of community organizers and activists. Leah represents the fifth consecutive generation of pastors in the Daughtry family. She's a multifaceted leader with roles in several organizations, but I've invited her here today to discuss with us the political prowess of Black women. And I'm asking her to talk about that with us because she is a incredible power broker and leader oftentimes behind the scenes of advancing and advocating for uh, Black women in politics. And I don't know if many of you all remember this, but Dr. Daughtry, or Leah Daughtry is the co-author along with Donna Brazil and Yolanda Caraway and Mignon Moore of the book, Colored Girls Who Considered Politics. And it won the NAACP Image Awards and many other awards. They were on television. I think, Leah, I saw you on The The View and all these shows talking about that book. I was so proud of you. And she is known as one of the four most powerful African-American women in politics. And that book shares the story of their friendship and how that friendship changed politics in America. Welcome, Leah. So glad to have you on the show. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. It's so good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for being here. And it's so much more to talk about with you, but I just wanted to share this other tidbit. You were the chair of the Democratic National Convention that nominated Barack Obama, am I correct, for president? And tell us a little bit about what that role was all about. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, I, I describe it as building a small city from the ground up. And I've I'm, I'm been very blessed to have served as the CEO of the convention that nominated Barack Obama, but also the convention that nominated Hillary Clinton. So that made me the only person in Democratic Party history to have held the position twice. But what you essentially do is you're building a small city to accommodate 40,000 people over the course of a week. And so it's all of the minutia of things like where are people going to stay? What are the bus routes look like? And what color white are you painting the podium? Because who knew there were so many different shades of white? Uh, with all And what color the carpet is and what the state is going to sit where? But then it's the bigger things. What's the program? What's the message? What are we presenting to the American people? It's one of the most watched events in the world. And so uh, the stakes are always very high. So if you can imagine the little things all the way to the big things, that's what planning a convention is all about. And the key thing is you got to be on time. So my motto always is on time, on task, on budget. You don't get another day. You can't say, wait, I'm not ready. Come back tomorrow. You got to be ready on the day that the convention starts. When that gavel hits hits down, You everything's got to be on go. And how long did it take to plan all of that from the street routes to the program? To, I know security is a big deal. So how much planning time did it require? It requires about two years of planning and you actually uh, move to the city. So for me, I moved to Denver in 2008. I moved to Philadelphia for 2016 because it's everything is easier when you're on site and can walk routes and can go into the hall and kind of plot and plan. Where are the outlets? Where's the HVAC going? How much more HVAC do you need to add? How much more cable do you need to run to accommodate 
uh, all the devices that people bring to the convention, all the television cameras. So you actually are in city for a year and then a year before that planning as well. Oh my goodness. Well, I, both of those conventions were absolutely fabulous. And in fact, my granddaughter worked in the first one for, uh, for uh, President Obama and she just is in awe of you. So I need to tell her to make sure she tunes into this particular show. Absolutely. Well, Leah, you've had a long history of, of uh, really supporting and advocating for women and women of color and particularly black women in the whole arena of politics. And I know there are other things you do in terms of the work in, in working with unions, ensuring that there's diversity and inclusion in the whole union space. And I mean, just so many things you do. But today I want to talk about this prowess of black women. And I remember uh, when uh, President Biden was, you know, struggling for the nomination and he got it and he got it, people said really on the black on the back of black women voters in the in the black community. I know that you were often behind the scenes kind of positioning and and supporting and helping to maneuver to ensure that Black women had a voice. And it's interesting that 91% of Black women voted for Biden and Vice President Harris. That's right. You know, it, what we know is across every election, midterm elections, presidential elections, Black women are the most loyal and the most consistent voting bloc in the nation. Black women vote. Uh, and we show up no matter what the election is in, in large numbers and consistently. And that's because I think we understand what the political uh, infrastructure, what, the, what it means uh, to have people in office who impact our lives. We are the ones for the most part, you know, we're making a lot of the decisions in our communities, in our families, in our households. And so who is in office matters. We understand that. And listen, black women are full of opinions and voting is a way to make your opinion known. So we don't let an opportunity pass without letting folks know what we think, what we feel, what we're invested in and how we want to see our city, our state and our nation move forward. So we show up. So Leah, why, why are you, so, you know, we often ask um, our guests to share their why. And we know you come from a long, uh, uh, multiple generations of political activists and, and ordained ministers, but why have you chosen this particular uh, segment of activism to focus on, the prowess of Black women? Yeah, I, you know, it goes back to my faith tradition uh, and and what I believe about who God is and, and where God wants us to be. And it's simply this. I believe that every single human being has God-given breath and God-given potential. And so I do the work I do because I believe that people should have the right, the opportunity to realize their God-given potential. God distributes talent equally. We all have it, but sometimes opportunity uh, is, is not always distributed equally. And so my work focuses on ensuring that God's handiwork, God's creation, which is you and me and all of our all of us in the human family, have the opportunity to realize what God has given placed in them, the talents, the treasures that live inside their lives. And for those of us who are more challenged, I don't believe that God uh, intends for us to live unequal lives, for us to be, for some of us, because of the color of our skin or because of our gender, that we we have fewer opportunities. We have more closed doors. And so my work focuses on opening doors, leveling playing fields, and creating opportunities so that all of us, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of our gender, are able to walk into the purpose that God created for us. Well, as I listen to you to talk about that, and that is just so impressive and, and touching, it reminded me in the last presidential election how a group of several groups of black women decided that they were going to dream big and be bold and asking and demanding for what they felt they had the privilege and earn the right. And that was to have a black female or, or female of color as a, as a vice presidential candidate. What was that all about and how did that come to fruition? 
Well, you know, many of us uh, have worked in the political arena for decades, mm -hmm. and we have seen the political ascendancy of Black women as we have uh, taken the stage in business and economics and education and in politics. And we reached a point now where we are the acknowledged vote getters we are the acknowledged leaders in our community and so when the vice when the vice then vice president biden was making his decision about a running mate we said it's time it's time for to have a black woman in office not simply because we are qualified and we have an embarrassment of riches in terms of candidates who could be vice president but also because we've earned it we deserve it, we work hard, we go out, we vote, we haul many a candidate over the line to victory. And so it is time to acknowledge and to reward our faithfulness and our commitment to the Democratic Party, our commitment to the democracy that is America. And we have so many people who are qualified, why not? It's time. So, so we said about uh, organizing, each organizing ourselves to make the case. And we have enough relationships that eventually we had a meeting with then Vice President Biden to make our case directly to him about why uh, a black woman would be the appropriate candidate for him, would be a great teammate for him, and how that person would be able to help him win the election in November. And he listened carefully. We had a great conversation with him and then with his campaign managers and campaign advisors. And in the end, we know what history shows that he did in fact select Kamala Harris to be his running mate. And uh, President Biden has made a commitment to nominate the first black woman to the Supreme Court. And it struck me in a recent poll, and when they asked about the qualifications of a justice that they felt that 78% of so of Americans felt like the justice should be qualified. And it seems like that whole notion of being qualified is always a moniker placed in front of African-American and Black women ascending to these important roles. That's exactly right. And you look, first of all, Justice Breyer has been phenomenal uh, since uh, he was appointed to the bench by Bill Clinton. He has been one of the stalwarts in protecting every American's right to participate in this democracy. So when Vice President, when then Vice President Biden made the commitment on the campaign trail that he would nominate a black woman to the Supreme Court. We all cheered that in the 230 year history of the Supreme Court, there have there've only been four people of color, all of them except for Sonia Sotomayor, male. So this idea that the court should be balanced and representative is should be what every American wants. We all want fairness, we all want a voice, we all wanna be represented. The thing that really bothers me is that we are having this conversation about qualifications as if the president of the United States would nominate someone unfit or unqualified. And I think that's because he's talking, we're talking about a black woman. So people feel the need to say she must be qualified. Well, of course, whoever is nominated must be qualified. Here's the good news. We have so many black women who have been serving on appellate courts, on district courts, that the, uh, the president has many, many, many to choose from. We hear three names, but you, give me, I can write you down 20 of uh, women who are qualified, who have already held judgeships, even though that's not a requirement in the constitution. The constitution doesn't even require that they be a lawyer. The constitution, <laughs> president can nominate whoever that he wants to nominate, he or she wants to nominate. So we are looking forward to uh, who the uh, president is going to choose. He said he's going to choose someone by the end of the month, end of February, and then the hearings will begin. But you can see in the news, the list is long, the list of qualified, qualified women is long, and the list of women who have been previously confirmed by the United States Senate is significant. They've already gone through that gauntlet. So yes, of course they're qualified and they will bring their lived experience as black women to the conversation that the justices have as they interpret the constitution of the United States. Well, we know that there's probably a lot of politics that are going on now in terms of, you know, whose name is getting positioned and who's getting what kind of support. Can you give us a little 
story about how that plays out? Well, what normally happens is, you know, there's uh, names that get bandied about some we've heard, some we haven't heard. And traditionally, the president interviews them. There's a huge vetting operation that happens behind the scene to go through their backgrounds, to look at their records, to make sure that, that their judicial record uh, it aligns with the values of the president of the United States, that there are no, not going to be any surprises if you can help it. And then the president interviews them. It's usually secret. And so there's a lot of staking out at the White House of the media to see who's going in and who's coming out. Because clearly the president can't meet you at a restaurant, right? So people are coming into the White House. So the media is going to, you'll see them staking out and and, and trying to uh, give us hints and give a scoop on who went in and who went out. And then once the president announces, then the gauntlet begins. And what they will traditionally do is go to the Senate. The nominee will go to the Senate and meet with and have drop-ins with all 100 senators to make to say hello, to have conversation, so that each one will have the opportunity to meet the nominee. Uh, and then the hearings begin, and those can be very grueling. Some of us have watched hearings in the past, whether you've yes. watched Kavanaugh and Coney Barrett. If I go back, I think the first hearing I watched was Clarence Thomas. Me too. <laughs> which was a whole education, a whole yeah. education. And I would say to your listeners, listen, when the hearings start, tune in. Tune in and watch the process because it is really a civics lesson that we all should have. And once there's a vote, then we will have someone install. Here's the, and here's the importance of Kamala Harris. The Senate is evenly split. There are 50 Democrats and 50 Republicans. For the nomination of, the, of a Supreme Court justice, it requires 51. It's a simple majority, 51. Assuming that the Republicans, assuming, and this is a big assumption, that the GOP decides not to vote for uh, Kamala Harris, so that's 50 against, and you have 50, 50 in support of the nomination, Kamala Harris, the Vice President of the United States, becomes the tiebreaker. So we were lo looking at a historic moment where the first Black woman Vice President breaks the tie to confirm the first Black woman Supreme Court Justice. Okay, well, I hope it doesn't get to that. I hope several of the Republicans vote for her because of the contributions she's already made and the contributions she will make. That's right. Enhancing our society. So and that would be good for our country yes. to have bipartisanship there. Well, well, Leah, as I, as I hear you talk about it, clearly you, you know how to uh, operate and navigate in power circles. How do you think women in general feel about playing in the power circle? What are the lessons you've learned about that? You know, I've learned that uh, many times we as women, we as Black women, often discount our experience and discount our credentials. And so when I'm coaching people or talking with people, I, I often say, listen, you are probably more qualified than anybody else in that room. So walk in there like you own it. And we know how to do that as women. We know how to walk into spaces and make like. So sometimes you gotta fake it till you make it. But I would like to encourage folks that consider, don't just consider your experience behind a desk in an office, your life experience is important and your life experience is experience that most people don't have. We've had to learn how to uh, uh, code switch. We've had to learn there's one way to be in the hood, there's one way to be in your salon, there's one way to be in the office and we know how to speak those varying different languages. That's a skill that most people don't have. Uh, the, the ability to navigate different communities, the ability to read a room. And, and we've had to do that for our survival. And to be able to go in and say, mm -mm, this is not a safe situation, let me get out or let me diffuse it. We know how to do that. And those are skills, soft skills, we sometimes call them, Vanessa. Oh, oh, they're pretty hard, aren't they? Walk into a room with, we should not discount those. Sister, don't discount that. Don't discount that it's important and it's part of your deck of, uh, of experiences that make you a valued and valuable part of any team. Well, I know that you and, and, and Donna and Mignon and, and others have started this group, Power Rising. 
And it sounds like you, you're in your Reverend Leah Daughtry mode when you talked about power and own the room and own your experience and put it out there. Tell us about Power Rising and why did you all choose to form that organization? You know, it started because uh, post 2016 when Hillary Clinton lost and black women had voted 94% for her. And yet she lost and she lost to someone that we felt was wholly unqualified to serve. We were, I was mad. And after, you know, after three days in bed and I got up, I said, okay, we got to do something. And Congresswoman Waters invited me to come to speak to the Congressional Black Caucus Women's uh, uh, Group. And we talked about the election and then she said, well, what should we do now? I said, we need to gather ourselves. And if I had my magic wand, I would gather black women and ask us, what do we wanna do now? How do we leverage this power that we know we have? And that is how we begin planning Power Rising. And we took the name, uh, one of our sisters, uh, Reverend Tracy Blackman, she said, we always talk about speaking truth to power. Mm -hmm. What about power speaking truth? And so that's how we started uh, this, power called, this thing called Power Rising. And it is an intergenerational gathering place for Black women. Our work is organized around five pillars, business and economic empowerment, culture and community, education and innovation, health and wellness, and political empowerment. We bring women, Black women, if you consider yourself a Black woman, you are welcome to come. And we bring them together with speakers. Also Black women, it is a totally Black woman space that we don't shut the door. There have been men who come. There have been white people who come. But it is, it is for, designed for, by, and about Black women to come and uh, learn skills, to be in conversation with other places, to be in a safe space. Sisters will come down in the bathroom some days. Sometimes they come dressed to the hilt. Uh, people, moms bring their daughters, daughters bring their moms. The youngest we've ever had is six months and the oldest is 93. And so they come and they, it's just a place where we love on each other, support each other, learn from each other, inspire each other and empower each other to run for office, to start the business, to go back to school, to learn a craft, to do whatever it is you wanna do. And one of the most unique things is that it's an egalitarian space. So we don't do reserved seatings except for our mamas. We save seats for the elders. But other than that, you might look and you might be sitting next to a member of Congress, or you might be sitting next to a Fortune 500 C-suite person. We're just all in there, Black women together, learning and growing uh, with each other. So it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. We have always have to cap it because there are so many women, but we want it to feel intimate. So we never go over 1500 women. Oh, that's a nice size. In a snap. So how do people connect with Power Rising? Where do they find go information? Yes, go to our website, www.powerrising.org. And you can sign up for emails. We just finished two weeks ago, a forum on fibroids. How to, because Black women uh, disproportionately navigate challenges with fibroids. Uh, so we had a great panel about that. We have one coming up that will be about menopause, the change, because we don't talk about it until, mm -hmm. you know, you burn it up and you got to take all your clothes off on the airline like I was. And I was like, what is happening to me? Nobody told me. So we're going to be doing menopause and we're going to do something soon on cryptocurrency which is the hot new thing that we ought to know what, even if you don't have the funds to invest or don't want to invest, you ought to know how it works. Oh, what it is. Now, are these virtual connects or are these in those, person? Those that I just mentioned are virtual. We will be resuming our in-person gatherings in September. Uh, when the, It's going to be smaller though. We're going to cap it so we can be COVID respectful. Uh, mm -hmm. And so when we send that announcement out, you want to get on the mailing list because when we send the announcement out about the September gathering, uh, it's going to be first come, first serve, and we're capping at 500 people. Well, let me, let me ask you, uh, Reverend Daughtry, in the last minute or so we have together, um, you know, there, there's a lot of activity to negate the voting right and power of communities of color through all of these uh, voter restriction laws. What would be one piece of advice you would you would provide 
our viewers and our listeners about how to address that in the community in which they live? Find out what the voting uh, rules are. They are changing. 33 states have implemented new rules, new laws around your voting rights. So find out what the laws are in your area and be prepared. They've made it harder, they're making it more difficult, but we know we will not be deterred. We will not be denied, we will not be dismissed, but you gotta know the rules. You don't wanna show up election day and find out you need you know, an extra piece of ID or that your polling place has moved. Find out what the rules are. But secondly, call your senators and tell them you want to see your voting rights protected. You want the federal government to step in and ensure that we have the protections that we need to have equal access to the ballot. We're not asking for special access, equal access to the ballot. Well, Dr. Reverend, I, I know I want to keep calling you doctor. You said, well, I'm not a doctor yet. But I mean, to me, you've earned that doctor uh, title time and time again. But Reverend Leah Daughtry, I want to thank you for just taking the time to inform our viewers and listeners and to give us some of the inside uh, perspective and stories on how things work and operate and really to encourage us to continue functioning with both vision and determination and, and courage. So I want to thank you so much for being part of our show today. And I want to thank you for all of the work that you've done to advance the interests of Black women, the interests of women, and the interests of people of color. So on behalf of my team for working it out, I'm Dr. Vanessa Weaver, your host, and I wish you a safe, productive, and what we call Be Happy Week. Goodbye. Working It Out is brought to you by Alignment Strategies, a management consultancy with more than three decades of experience in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and organizational development. To learn more, visit alignmentstrategies.com. Got problems on the job. We're working it out. With that workplace got you stressing. We're working it out. With that yeah, we're working it out. Working it out. Working it out.